you know, we're in this series that we're calling I See a Church. And the series, it's a three-week series where we're giving a refreshed vision of Harvester Christian Church's vision moving forward. And we're, we're talking about what it looks like to be a church in today's day and age. And maybe some of the things that we want to walk towards and move towards. And I'm, I'm really excited about where we've landed over, over the past six months. We've been praying as a leadership and we've been walking through the scriptures and we've been having conversations together and we really believe that God has a vision for our church that isn't new to God. It's not even new to churches. It's something that he's called us to from the very beginning. But it's something that we're going to be recommitting to in this moment and over the next few decades. And last week we talked about that if we're going to be a church that makes a difference in this world, then we have to remember that we are a church in the world. And if we're a church in the world, we have to have the right perspective of the world. That the world isn't just the enemies and outsiders they're not evil and broken, rather the world is lost and wounded. And when we can get that right, when we can understand that they're not our enemies, but they're lost and wounded, that changes our heart and the way that we approach the world. It changes the way that we, we see the world. And so once we get that right, then the question we have to ask is what do we do in a lost and wounded world? And so that's where we raise up above the clouds and we get this perspective, that if the world is lost and wounded, and if we are lost and wounded as well, then here's what we need to do. We need to encounter Jesus. And this is a phrase you're gonna be hearing a lot in the years to come at Harvester Christian Church, is that we are a church that is seeking to encounter Jesus. And that happens in this weekend service. This is a weekend encounter. This is a, a worship encounter where we get to come face to face with our Lord and Savior, and we get to hear his heart. And if you want to know his heart, then what we find out in John chapter 1 is that his heart is one of grace and truth. That's the heart of Jesus. When you come to encounter Jesus, you find out the truth of who you are and the grace of who he is. And the truth is that we got a long way to go. That there's, there's sin in our life, there's things in our life that don't look like Jesus. There's, there's things that we do, things that we think, things that we feel that are dark and that Jesus wants to change. And if we allow him to change it, he will. But the grace is that we can bring that to God and know that he loves us and that he passionately loves us and he showed his love through the cross. And in reality is, grace and truth is a picture of the cross. The cross sends a message that our, our sin is real and deserves to be punished, and that's the message of the cross, but the message of the cross is also that God's love is real, and he desires us to be in a relationship, and he calls us into a relationship knowing that we are lost and wounded people. But our mission can't end with just encountering Jesus. You see, the reality is you can come to the cross and have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, but never actually be changed never actually receive healing. And our mission as a church is that we wanna lead people to find Jesus, yes, but what else do we wanna do? We wanna help people follow Jesus. We are a church that leads people to find and to follow Jesus. And the way that we follow Jesus is that when we come to the cross, we don't just look at the cross and applaud what Jesus did, we do what Jesus called us to do, is that once you've come to the cross, now you take up your cross and you follow him. And that's where we begin to experience life transformation and life change. And that's when, in reality, we, become to, we, we begin to look like Jesus. If Jesus picked up his cross and we pick up ours, that's when we begin to look like him. And so we're not just going to encounter Jesus, but here's the second thing that we're going to do as a church moving forward. We are going to become like Jesus. We are a church that encounters Jesus, but then we go through the process of becoming like Jesus. Now, here's the sad reality. You can encounter Jesus, but never be changed by Jesus. I know that's surprising to some of you. But, but you can actually encounter Jesus and never be changed by him. You, you see that throughout the Gospels, don't you? I mean, just the, the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. It's this young guy who he, he comes to Jesus and he has this face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. He knows the grace and truth of Jesus, that, that Jesus wants to welcome him in. He knows the truth that, that he lacks something. He embraces that. He comes to Jesus and he says, what, what am I missing? What's the truth? What do I lack? If I'm going to inherit the kingdom, if I'm going to inherit eternal life, what do I need to do? And so Jesus tells him, you know what? Sell all your possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, and then follow me. Don't just meet me face to face. 
Don't just try to get a, a, a little a bit of goodness from me. Have your life centered on me. And so get rid of the things that are keeping you from being centered on me and then follow me. He has a face-to-face encounter with Jesus. But when he hears Jesus tell him what it's going to cost, the cross that he's going to have to bear, it says that he walks away and he's sad. He had an encounter with Jesus, but never became like Jesus. There's a, there's a haunting passage in Matthew chapter 7 that points to this as well. And it's a, it's a passage that every time I read it, it sends chills down my spine just thinking about, you know, worship gatherings like this that happen all across the world. And we, we gather as the body of Christ, as Christians, and we, we sing songs to God, and we, we call him our Lord and Savior. And the assumption is that if you're in the room, then you're good to go. But what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, he says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? Essentially what they're doing is they're like, what do you mean I'm not part of your kingdom, God? Like I went to church, I I did the Christian things, I sang songs where where I called you Lord. I I sang these songs and I, I encountered, I saw you and I said those things about you. What do you mean I don't get to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, I will tell you plainly, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Here's the the harsh reality. It is possible to encounter Jesus at the cross, but to never go on a journey of getting to know him, of following him, allowing him to know you, allowing him to transform you and transform your heart. Here's what we do instead, though. We encounter Jesus at the cross. We we encounter Jesus, we see Jesus, and sometimes from afar, and sometimes on a Sunday morning. And we hear the stories about him and the things that he did. And we're like, man, I I wanna be like Jesus. I wanna do the things that Jesus did. Like, Jesus, how do I become good? Like, you're obviously good, I wanna do the good things that you do. Like, Jesus, I wanna take care of the poor. I wanna be generous, I wanna be a caring person. And we go on this journey of we want to be like Jesus. But here's the problem. Many of us want to be like Jesus when he was in the spotlight. But how many of us want to be like Jesus when he was in the corner, praying for hours upon hours all by himself? You know, there's a 1980s commercial, Gatorade commercial, starring Michael Jordan. And the tagline of that commercial was, be like Mike. Everybody wants to be like Michael Jordan. So those of you Gen Xers in the room or millennials who watched Michael Jordan growing up, anybody? We know who's better. Jordan is better than LeBron, right? We all know that. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? Yep. Jordan is the best that ever was. And I remember um, being a middle school kid wanting to be like Michael Jordan, except for the fact that I'm five foot eight and have no skills whatsoever. Um, but in my mind, when I was all by myself on that basketball court, I could be like Mike. I I remember grabbing the basketball court in the back of my grandmother's house. She had this this basketball goal in the back of their garage. And I would take the shot, pretending like I was Michael Jordan, but it was always at the last five seconds of the game, right? All of us played out this scenario growing up, last five seconds of the game. Scotty Pippen passes us the ball. Three, two, one, brick. All right, let me do that again. Let me do that again. Get the ball back, dribble. Three, two, one. Brick, no wait, the, the clock wasn't working right. Three, two, and I could never make it. I just wasn't Mike. No matter how much I wanted to be like Mike, I wanted to act like Mike, I could never be like Mike. A few months ago, I watched Last Dance documentary and realized why I will never be like Mike. That dude practices hard. He didn't just play hard on the court. I mean, he was phenomenal on the court, but then you see him going through practice He's doing the killers, and he's first. He's, he's not taking it for granted. He's running the hardest, practicing. He's, he's going the fastest. He's sweating. He's not just doing it during practice. He's practicing before practice and after practice. He's always thinking basketball, and that's when I realized I don't care about basketball. I don't, I don't want to practice like Mike. I just want to be like Mike. Now, here's the reality. Many of us, we want to be like Jesus, And we think that we can just go out into the world 
when the spotlight's on us and be like Jesus and do what Jesus did. I mean, a whole generation of us was, were raised on this idea of what would Jesus do. We, we, wanna, we wanna be like Jesus when he's in public, but how are we at being like Jesus when he was in private, in those private moments? You see, whenever I think about what does it, come, what does it take to become like Jesus, it has nothing to do with like, sending you out to do Jesus things in this world. If we're gonna become like Jesus, it's all about what we're doing before we ever get onto the public stage, before we ever go to our workplaces, before we ever go on mission trips, before we ever pick up a shovel to serve someone else. So the question I, I, I've been praying over and, and trying to get a, get a grasp on is, God, just show me, show me what it looks like to become like Jesus. How is Harvester gonna help this group of people become more like Jesus? And I gotta tell you, I know what some of you are thinking, and you're excited, and you're like, I, I, here's what we need to do. We, we need to be sent into the world to make a difference, just like Jesus did. Just, just give us opportunities to serve. Give us opportunities to talk about Jesus. Give us opportunities and events and programs to send us out to make a difference in the world. That's what we're gonna do, right? Nope. Not yet, at least. Before you ever go into the world, my prayer is that you go to your knees. And that's what we're gonna do first. Here's what I don't want to do. I don't want people to come face to face with Jesus, encounter Jesus' grace and truth, skip the transformation process, and then go into the world and talk about Jesus. When Jesus all the while is saying, hold on, I don't know that person. Like, don't listen to that person. Like, they, they never spent a, a day in their life with me. If we're going to become like Jesus, my prayer is that we don't just go into the world, but that we go to our knees. I see a church that learns how to pray. I see a church that spends time discerning God's voice through the scriptures. And I'm not just talking about in this setting. I'm talking about on your own. I see individuals that, that slow down instead of speeding up. If you can't do that, if you can't slow down and just spend time with God and spend time with Jesus on your own, why, why would we want to release that into the world? Do you know how Jesus' ministry started? Do you know how his ministry to the world started? First and foremost, he was baptized. He, he was baptized, and whenever he came out of those waters, it says that the Holy Spirit descended, ascended, descended down onto him, and this voice from heaven came out that said, this is my son. It's almost like the spotlight on Jesus. Like the, the whole world's attention is now on Jesus. In this moment of time, in his baptism, this is my son whom I love Listen to him. You know, if that was us in that moment, our reaction would be like, all right, I gotta perform now. The spotlight's on me. I gotta do something now. Like, I gotta show the world something miraculous or say something amazing. You know what happens next? Jesus spends 40 days in the desert, fasting and praying and meditating on the words of God. He didn't go straight to the stage. He went to the desolate places in the wilderness to spend time with God. And if we're gonna become like Jesus, we can't just put people on stages and platforms of serving and, and send them out into the world. We have to send them into these relational environments where we can be with God. And there's two specific relational formative environments that I want our church to focus on moving forward. If we're gonna become like Jesus, then I see a church that, that embraces these two environments. Contemplative environments and communal environments. Contemplative environments and communal environments. And we have to embrace both of them. The communal environment is something that we know a lot about. We talk about this a lot, the importance of being together in community. Like right now, this is a communal environment where you guys have left one place and joined together, you've gathered together as the church to experience God and to experience his presence and to encounter him. We, we have to embrace those environments, but we also have to embrace the contemplative environments. If communal is being together with God, contemplative is being alone with God. And we have, we have to embrace both of those because here's the reality. Most of us swing one way or the other. Some of us are, are really good at the contemplative environments where it's like, I just want me and God and my Bible and my prayer time and I just thrive off of those moments and I don't really need 
to be in community with other people. Now, here's a harsh reality. Some of you who are online right now, I know you want to be in community, but others of you, you just prefer that contemplative place where it's just you and God alone, and this just frightens you. And some of us swing that way, where we don't really want to be in relationship with other people. But then other people swing the other way. And I think this is probably more of us, where we want to be in community, and we want to be together with God, but being alone with God on our own, that scares us to death. What do I do? Like, how do I pray when I'm on my own? I have a Bible. What do I do with it? Like, if I open up, do I just... Like flip through and just like, God, give me a verse. Okay. Like that's, we don't know what to do in those, those moments where we're alone with God. And we have to embrace the tension that both of those are important. In the communal life, it's, it's this busy life and it's this hurried life. The contemplative life is not a hurried life, it's a hushed life. It's a life of more quietness and more silence and more solitude, not isolation, but it's solitude alone with God. And this is what becoming like Jesus off the stage is about. When you look at Jesus' life, he was about community. One of the very first things he did in his ministry is he recruited a group of guys to do ministry with. That, that, that was his group. And he trained them and he, and he worshiped God with them and they, they meditated on scriptures together and they prayed together and they did ministry together and they did some amazing things, but then what does Jesus do? Very often, he pulls away from them to be by himself, to pray, to leave them to the points where there's a lot of times where they're wondering where Jesus went. They're they're looking for him. They can't find him. It's because he's went off to be with the Father all by himself. And we have to embrace both of those. And that's not just something that Jesus did, but it's something that he calls us to as well. In Mark chapter 6, we get this, this story of Jesus having these group of guys, and he's been training them, he's been teaching them the ways of the kingdom, and then he finally gives these 12 men the opportunity to do what he does. And he says, I'm going to give you the power and the authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick and to preach the good news. And so he pairs these 12 guys up, he sends them into the city to do this, and he stays back all by himself for this contemplative time of prayer. And so the 12 guys, they go out and they heal the sick. And they preach the good news, and they they see lives changed, and they see demons fleeing, and they're excited, and they all come back to Jesus. And this is what it says in Mark chapter 6, starting with verse 30. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And you you got to believe they were excited when they were recounting the stories. It's like, man, I saw, I saw Peter, he'd go out there, he was passionate, he was talking about you, Jesus, he was talking about the Father and the need to, to, to do what the Father does and to be in the will of the Father, and people were eating it up, Jesus, they love you. And then Andrew, he was praying for someone, and a demon fled, and then Philip, he laid his hands on someone, and someone received sight, and they were recounting all of these things. Basically, Jesus, look at our activity. Aren't you impressed with us? And like, what do you think Jesus says right after that? Here's Jesus' immediate words. It says, Jesus said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Here's what Jesus is telling them. That's awesome. Now let's move from the hurried place to the hushed place. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. And if you read the Gospels, we miss this, but there's this rhythm to Jesus' life of doing ministry and rushing and going from town to town. In fact, in the book of Mark, Mark uses the word immediate, I believe it's around 30 times, to to talk about Jesus' ministry, that Jesus immediately went from here to there, and then he immediately did this, and then he immediately went here, and he's on this journey to the cross, and you get the sense that there's this, there's this rush, there's this hurry, there, there's this activity in the ministry of Jesus, but scattered throughout that, it's not just a, a rush, but it's also a hush, where Jesus pulls away, and he goes off to the mountain to pray by himself. He pulls his disciples away to get on the boat, on the sea, where nobody can clamor, where nobody can, can crowd around them and they can just spend time with the Father. There's this, there's this rhythm to Jesus' life and I think it's a rhythm that we need. And I think the pandemic has, has proved that. I mean, these last 18 months, it's been, a, 
it's been an interesting thing to watch the church go through. Because, you know, the church, we're, we're really good at being together with God, but very few people are good at being alone with God. And so back in March of 2020, when we had to talk to, talk to everybody and say, hey, right now we can't be together with God physically. We can't gather together. But that doesn't mean that God's not present. Man, I watched some people struggle with that. Because they're like, I only know how to do church. I only know how to worship if someone is leading me through. I only know how to read the scriptures if someone says, open up and I'm going to tell you about it. We know how to be together with God, but how many of us actually know how to spend time alone with God? And you know what I see in our future? If we're going to become like Jesus, then we have to figure out how to gather in community. Because I think there's a danger, and I think we should be aware and be leery of any Christian who can be alone with God, but they can't be together in community. I think we need to be leery of that. So we have to figure out how to be in community, but I also think you need to be leery of any Christian who can only be in community and cannot be alone with God. We have to learn how to study together. We have to to learn how to pray together. But we also have to figure out how to be alone with God. We have to learn how to sit with God and sometimes sit with God in prayer and sometimes just sit with God in silence. And we have to learn how to read the Bible for ourselves and study the Bible for ourselves and discern God's voice for our own lives. And we can't just encounter Jesus in church settings. We have to learn how to encounter Jesus in our prayer closets as well. And both of those are vitally important. We have to figure out how to study the Bible together and we have to figure out how to study the Bible alone. We have to learn how to to pray together in community and take care of one another. And we have to figure out how to pray alone with God and let him be the one who ultimately cares for us. There's this illustration that's been going through my mind the past few months that kind of describes the importance of doing these two things together. And it's, it's the picture of a wagon wheel, okay? So we've said that we are a church that is in the world, right? that our our mission has to start with an understanding that we live live in this big world and that God loved the world so much that he sent his son into the world, that the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so if we were to look at this as a wagon wheel, I view Jesus as the center, which isn't a bad place to start, okay? Jesus at the center is the right answer to almost any question. Now, if we're gonna become like Jesus, and we are out here in the world, it takes first off recognizing which direction that we need to go. That we encounter Jesus, we see Jesus, we hear his grace, we hear his truth, and then we go on this journey of becoming like him and moving closer and closer to Jesus. It's a a journey that's often called sanctification or spiritual formation where we go on this journey to become like Jesus. Now, here's my question. Who's responsible for you getting to be like Jesus and to become closer to Jesus? Whose responsibility is that? That's your responsibility. A lot of us, we put that on the church. And we say, man, I'm going hungry. Like, I need a church that feeds me. You know what you need to do? You need to learn how to feed yourself. Like, grow up and start eating the food of Jesus. It's available. Now, there there is a starting point where the church does play a role in saying, man, this is who Jesus is, and here he is now. Go have a meal with him. Go eat with him and turn it over him. I think what we've realized over the last 18 months is a lot of us are still being spoon-fed the grace and truth of Jesus. And so we have to personally go on this journey towards becoming like Jesus. Now, here's why I call it a wagon wheel illustration, because The church isn't just one individual, but the church is made up of a whole bunch of individuals, ideally, who are moving towards Jesus, that I'm moving towards Jesus, that you are growing closer to Jesus, that Ben Merrill, still getting closer to Jesus, Doyle Roth, still getting closer to Jesus, our young folk, our high schoolers, getting closer to Jesus, our our senior adults, getting closer to Jesus, that all of us are getting closer to Jesus, and us individually are responsible for that. 
contemplatively. We're praying, we're reading, we're learning how to feast on Jesus alone. Now here's the beauty of that. The closer I get to Jesus, and the closer you get to Jesus, the closer we get to each other. The closer we get to each other. And I think here's some of the strain and some of the tension that we felt over the last 18 months, not just in our church, but I believe the church in our country, is that not many people were getting closer to Jesus, but we still wanted to be in community together. But we started replacing the center with other things. And the reality is that when you're in the world, we get this idea that, man, I need a group of, like, if I'm going to become like Jesus, here, here's how I do it. I need, not just Jesus, Jesus is good, Jesus is fine, but I need a group of people who are my age. If we can just put my age in the center and get a whole bunch of people who are that age heading in that direction, then maybe I can become like Jesus. Or I need a, a, a group of people who are in the same life stage as me. Like I need a, a married couple who has two kids who are these ages, and if I can find that, then I'll be in a community that's, that's worth being in. Or I need to be in a community of people who um, are on this side uh, of the river or in this county or have this, this race or have this socioeconomic status. And, and we try to make ourselves the center of it. Essentially what we try to do is we try to take all the things that were in the world that define us and we try to put those in the center. And we try to move towards those things. And here's what eventually happens, is that when we're in the world, this is when we are farthest apart from each other. When, the, when we try to make the world to be the things that define us, the things outside of Jesus, and then we try to get in a community together, this is why so many of you would have troubled with group life. Because you've been in a group that's not centered on Jesus, you've been in a group that's trying to be in community with something from the world. But if you can move towards Jesus, and I can move towards Jesus, that gap grows so much smaller. And now, it doesn't matter if you're 20 years older than me or if you're 20 years younger than me. We can do life together. We can be in community together because here's what we have in common. We're both moving towards Jesus. We're both moving towards Jesus. I think that part of the, my frustration in this last year is that We've tried to build the church around central ideas that weren't central to the gospel message. We're like, man, I'm struggling with my church because my church isn't saying this, this particular stance, taking this particular stance from the pulpit. Or my church isn't taking this stance from the pulpit. Or I, I need a church that is all about this. Or I need a church that's all about this. Can we just get rid of this and put Jesus back at the center? If we can learn how to do that, guess what'll happen? You'll become like Jesus. I'll become like Jesus, and we'll become like Jesus together. So what does that look like practically for us? Practically, I've asked our spiritual formation ministries to champion this, our groups ministries, our, 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 our small group ministries to champion this. Um, and, and that's made up of a few different ministries. The first one is Next Gen. The Next Gen ministries is one of our spiritual formation ministries where we've, we've looked at the, the kids' ministry and the student ministry and the young adult ministry, and we've said, and put them together in community. I don't care if they go to the same school or not. I don't care if they're from different backgrounds. I don't care if they're from different stances on what's popular, what's not popular. Like, put them together and teach them how to do life together. Help them to become like Jesus together. And our, our next-gen ministries, they, they, they do small groups so that you can become like Jesus. The next-gen ministries, they create events and retreats so that we can become like Jesus they give our kids and they give our, our students and our college students mentor leaders to help them become like Jesus. We also have our adults versions of that as well, our, our adult ministry programs where we have groups and where we try to get you into circles instead of rows. And that's one of the things that we've said is that like this setting is great and you can encounter Jesus here, but if you really want to experience spiritual transformation, that happens best in circle settings, not in row settings where you're face-to-face -face with one another and, and you're talking about the scriptures and you're praying together and you're doing life together and some of you have avoided that and in the process, you're not becoming like Jesus as much as you could. Circles are better than rows, so we need to get into circles. We also have our care ministries where 
that they create space specifically for times of pain or times where people are just in need and they create environments where we can just come together and care for each other and take care of the community. And they've also created a, a place on Wednesday nights called The Vine where it's a contemplative place where you can come and experience the hushed life instead of the hurried life. And, and we're gonna do these things and these ministries are gonna champion those. And one of the other things I've asked them to champion is don't just put us in community environments, but man, next gen, I'd love for you to teach our students how to pray alone and not just led by their parents. Teach our kids how to read the scriptures. Groups, T teach our people in groups, not how to just to get together and to, to eat together and to, to do life together and, and have social activities, but teach them how to pray and teach them how to be with Jesus on their own. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna, we're gonna study together. We're gonna have Bible studies and we're gonna, we're gonna do those things together. But man, I'd love for you guys to figure out how to help our church do that on their own. Which means your home is the place and the environment that I really want us to focus on in the years to come. Not just the next gen ministry, not just adult ministries, not just care ministries, but I'd love to see you live a contemplative life from your home. You see, I've been a part of some great small groups and I know many of you in here are a part of a great small group right now. But you know what's been the most forming spiritual practice for my faith? It's been my contemplative times of prayer in reading. Now don't get me wrong, I, I love going to small group, I, I love the, the men and women in my small group, um, but nothing comes close to my chair in my living room. Like man, that's the place. That's the place for me where I, I experience Jesus and I encounter Jesus and me and God, we, we've had some intimate conversations and we, we've had some come to Jesus moments in that chair. There's been many times where I've just had to come to Jesus after reading scriptures on my own and I've just had to repent. Where I know that my life doesn't match up to his word. And I've had moments where I've just had to just put my Bible down and just thank him and praise him and be grateful to him. There's been times where I've sat in silence just knowing that the presence of God was with me. And I don't know if you've ever felt that. Where it's just you and it's, God and he's there and it's just like I don't have anything to say I don't have anything to read I just want to sit in your presence and I've had times where I've sat there and I've known that God was there and I've had other times where I've sat there just wondering if I'm sitting there alone and you know those have been forming times as well you know my hope over the next few years is to spark a desire in you to meet with the Savior that I get to meet with, the Savior that has changed my life, that has healed my wounds and continuing to heal my wounds. I hope to spark in you a desire to pray on your own. I hope to spark in you a desire not just to come to church to hear the scriptures exegeted, but to go to your prayer closet and hear the scriptures speak and exegete your own life. I hope that our spiritual formation ministries are gonna resource you to do that over the years to come to provide you with devotions, to provide you with spaces, to provide you with spiritual practices. And we're gonna intentionally focus on that. But ultimately the responsibility is on you. We can set up the environment. We can give you the resources. But you're the one who has to encounter Jesus. And when you encounter him, you become like him. When you go to those contemplative environments and those communal environments, you become like him. Jesus. And I believe that can happen at home, but I also believe that can happen here. And so one of the things that we're going to do, even in our worship services on the weekend, is we're going to create space for contemplative times. I think communion is one of those spaces where you get to have a one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. But one of the things that I hope becomes common here is not just activity to activity, hurried worship, but space as well for you to meet with Jesus. And so that's what I want to do right now. I want to give you some space just to meet with Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are. So if you don't mind just standing with me. And we're gonna go to God in prayer right now. But here's what's gonna happen. I'm not gonna pray the words for you. And I know some of you, this is gonna be uncomfortable for you. 
You're, you're gonna wait for us to hurry and rush on to the next thing. Like, just start playing the song. Just start singing the song because I'm uncomfortable. Sit in the discomfort of being with Jesus and then watch what Jesus can do in the discomfort when he transforms you into his likeness. So church, what I want you to do as you stand, just close your eyes right there and spend a moment with Jesus.